Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our virtual clean med session today on building community health and resilience beyond COVID-19. We normally would have had this session at our annual conference, Clean Med, which was going to be in Orlando this year, but because of the virus, we've had to cancel it. Uh, the good news is that we have a, a tremendous lineup today um, with Denise Fairchild, who's the CEO and president of Emerald Cities Collaborative, Elga Garcia uh, Garza, who's the director of the Agricultura Network, and John Utek, who's the uh, at Cleveland Clinic Office for a Healthy Environment. He's the senior director there. So uh, we're going to give each panelist a few minutes to do opening remarks. And then we're going to have a, uh, a moderated dialogue among the panelists. Um, for those who've joined, if you have questions for any of the panelists or for all of us, uh, please submit them via the Q&A function on the Zoom. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with some opening remarks. Um, we are in a, a very poignant time in life of our country. Uh, this week, we will surpass 100,000 Americans that have died in the last three months due to COVID-19. Um, we're still in the middle of this crisis. And even though economies are opening up in, in a number of states around the country, there are 17 states which are still having more increases uh, in COVID cases. And in places like India and places like South America, we're already starting to see, see major surges. Inside of that, even after four months, we still don't have uh, testing capacity at a national level to know who is even carrying this virus. And still, after four months, we still are struggling to get honest and science-based accurate information from the federal government. The coronavirus has been a mirror for our society. It's exposed and amplified all the social, environmental, economic and racial inequities that we face every day and have for, for generations. It's also exposed the divisions in our society where wearing a mask has become a political litmus test rather than a basic public health protection. It's also been a mirror for our healthcare system. It's shown the, the failure of the business model, which depends on treating chronic disease and, and provides the, the majority of money from elective surgery and, and, and treating people who are chronically sick, as opposed to basic public health and basic care. In the middle of the largest uh, public health crisis that we faced in the last century, 1.4 million healthcare workers have been laid off. It's also showed us the vulnerability of our global supply chains. So in the middle of this pandemic, states are competing against each other to get basic protective equipment like gloves and masks and gowns and disinfectants. And in the money that's been distributed to hospitals as part of the CARE Act, the richest hospitals in America have gotten the lion's share of the, as opposed to the safety net hospitals that are dealing with some of the most vulnerable patients and the most exposed communities. The other, the other injustice in our society is that our healthcare insurance is tied to whether you have a job or not. So now there are 27 million Americans who are, are threatened with losing their healthcare coverage because they've lost their job. And yet, and yet, at the same time, the healthcare sector has shown itself to be incredibly powerful to, to have healthcare workers show up despite great um, threats to their own public safety and to bear witness and to provide care to people in this incredible moment of, of, of trauma for our society. So the virus also is an opportunity of awakening a transformation of consciousness. If anything were to tell us how interconnected we are as a planet has been this virus that one man in China could be infected and it could lead to a global pandemic is an amazing uh, display of interconnectivity. And it also provides an opportunity to awaken in compassion, compassion in all of us, to, to not look away, to see suffering and to try to move toward it and try to address it. And we see healthcare doing that. N these are the new American heroes uh, in our society. 
from the perspective of practice green health and healthcare without harm, uh, we see that the pandemic is showing us that we are uh, we have a desperate need to to create a new social contract uh, between healthcare and the rest of society. That that healthcare needs to move beyond healing individuals or treating individuals and healing communities and sustaining the planet, which provides the basis for the health of all of us. That healthcare needs to move upstream and address the conditions uh, that are making people sick in the first place. Poverty, pollution, uh, hunger, uh, lack of affordable housing, uh, lack of uh, basic, uh, uh, jobs that provide a living wage to people. Um, we see that healthcare uh, needs to uh, be involved in not only addressing the shocks uh, to our society, like pandemics and like the climate crisis, which is right upon us, but also the stressors that we face on a daily, in a daily uh, basis in our society. So with that context, I want to start uh, by introducing and, and uh, having our first panelists go. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Denise Fairchild, uh, who is the president of, of Emerald Cities Collaborative and is also on the board of directors of Healthcare at Harm. Denise, take it away. Thank you, Gary. And um, I have to apologize to everyone because we have the lawnmower and all of the motor gear that you can imagine in the back. Uh, background, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, I appreciate it. If we could just uh, take it to the next slide. Um, my name is Denise Fairchild, and I'm the president and CEO of Emerald Cities Collaborative. Uh, we are, um, interestingly, an organization that was formed out of the last major crisis. We grew, emerged out of the 2009 economic uh, financial crisis that faced the country, and our um, organization represents a coalition of labor, business, environmental, and community organizations. And at that time, the whole idea was how do we reimagine and rebuild America and, and pull ourselves out of that uh, economic crisis. And so the strategy was to green our cities and with that public and private investment, build strong communities with good paying jobs and business opportunities and, and ultimately strengthen our democracy by making certain that low-income communities of color got to be a part of this new green economy. Um, resilience was not on the chart at the time. Uh, we did not recognize then that um, disasters were going to be the new normal. Um, but we still thought that we were going to be able to make a difference and come back. to. If we had a, a sense of what resilience was, it was to get back to normal. And that's the place that we're in today. Right now, everybody is talking about, let's, uh, let's get back to business. Let's open up businesses. But we do have a new normal. Next slide. Next slide, please. So if we, uh, in the last 10 years, all of us have heard the word resilience. Uh, everybody is talking about resilience. Everybody's doing resilience planning. And it probably means something different for everyone. But this is just sort of the traditional but for us, it was just, let's get back to business. How do we bounce back, right? Traditional view of it. This governments are doing resilience planning, but fundamentally it's about fortifying and, and building and hardening our infrastructure, our transportation, our operations, our communications systems. Next slide. Uh, but I think as Gary clearly indicated that COVID really exposed that getting back to normal, back to business is no longer acceptable. That what we have seen through COVID, the realities of, of environmental, economic and social injustice, that we have exposed all of the vulnerabilities of income inequality, food insecurity, um, the, the, the health disparities that exist in this community in, the, in, our, in our country and the vulnerabilities of, of particularly low income communities. So resilience has to be something different. This is the work that MO Cities is gradually had graduated into. Next slide. What we are really trying to deal with now in, in the last five years is really how do we deal with reorganizing how our communities function? How do we move out of an extractive economy that is not only polluting us and causing environmental hazards, but it's also exploiting and our, our human resources as well as our natural resources. 
this is the work of resilience, is looking at these systemic and structural challenges that need to be repaired to become more resilient. Next slide. So that requires, and, and Gary said this, it requires a new compact, a new social compact between um, anchor institutions and communities, within communities and across communities. Um, how do we rebuild our, com our communities to be resilient? Next slide. So the way we like to think about it is, and particularly thinking of the health sector, when you think about the uh, anatomy of a healthy body, you think about all of the parts of the body that needs to function effectively and, uh, and to work well together. So we see the heart and the lungs and our respiratory system makes for a healthy body. Similarly, the way we see uh, this work is really about building a healthy community. And a healthy community has a number of interlocking parts as well. We have to, you know, the social, the economic, and the environmental infrastructure of our communities need to be healthy and they need to work in sync and to begin to look at this um, in, a, in a place, in a particular spot. And that's what really is different about what we currently, where we started as Emerald Cities, which is really a transaction. How do we get people into jobs? How do we get them good jobs? To figure out how we build resilient communities. Next slide. So there's a couple of things that we've been doing. The, the core of a resilient community for us is really a, a strong social infrastructure. Social cohesion has been uh, critical to our work. It, it has had, every research shows that it helps with uh, social networks, with resilience, climate resilience and adaptation, uh, getting jobs, getting better jobs, moving up the ladder, mental and physical health, efficacy, self-worth. All of these are critical components of a viable community. We've been working with a number of health institutions using a number of community engagement strategies. And that is the core of resilience. How do you uh, engage communities? We've been working with hospitals and their workers and using their workers as outreach um, and educational partners around putting community health needs assessments together. We've been building multi-stakeholder tables, working with anchors and communities, visioning how place, a healthy place should look. Um, and these are uh, critical components of building leadership, uh, political empowerment, stronger intermediary institutions. Next slide. In addition to our healthy so social infrastructure, we've also been working on building healthy economies, working with um, Healthcare Without Harm and Gary. We're, we're trying to figure out how we actually restructure our economies to be resilient. We clearly learned that we've got to, uh, in the food sector, for example, and the work that we're doing in Oakland, or Anchors in Resilient Communities, is really about shortening the supply chain in the food sector. And COVID made it very clear that we cannot rely on the current supply chain to get food to people when they need it and where they need it. So how do we create a food system that's local, um, that is community uh, controlled and owned, that creates good uh, paying jobs and business opportunities, um, and that is, is sustainable and healthy for people that most need it? Similarly, we're doing that uh, with the energy sector, working with the uh, procurement powers of major corporations as well as uh, government entities that have made commitments to 100% renewable. A transformative opportunity to change how energy um, operates in our communities so that not only is it sustainable and green, the renewable energy, but it also is creating job opportunities. It is also creating um, safe havens and, and resilient spaces for people in cases of brownouts or other kinds of disasters that happen uh, and, and really creating a different kind of, of way of looking at procurement, not just as just green energy, but really community resilience and community building. Uh, and similarly, we're doing that in other sectors in the housing sector and how to change the housing sector to be less toxic. Uh, so these are some of the uh, work that we're doing in restructuring our economies in sectors is a sector development strategy. It goes beyond you know, uh, the community gardens and, and the typical approaches, but aggregating the, the purchasing power of these institutions, of your institutions to actually shift markets, to transform markets, to be more resilient, to be more green, to be more just and to be more inclusive. Next slide. And then the, uh, the last part is really about uh, building the uh, healthy, natural, and built environment. 
um, as this slide really indicates, and as you all know, that 70% of all health problems relate to our environment. And if we know anything else, it's that your zip code will determine how toxic your life is, how toxic your community is, how toxic your homes are. And so the part of building resilience is to clean up the mess, is to clean up our environment, is to detox our, our transportation systems and to detox our buildings and to de detox our fossil fuel industry and to build greener, healthy communities. We've got to make investments in this way and change how energy, the kind of energy we use, and even how energy um, is distributed as well as water. How do we create uh, more local, sustainable um, energy systems, water systems, food systems? We've got to begin to think about it. And what we're trying to do is these, these sort of larger structural perspectives about uh, what resilience looks like. Next slide. Um, I'm just going to end by by saying that uh, this this work is is groundbreaking. It, it is potentially uh, challenging because it's it's pretty new for for everyone. But number one, it's an all-in strategy that it cannot be done by health institutions alone. That there are other anchor institutions that should be part of this this uh, this mission that we're on. And more importantly, uh, engaging community in the process is going to be key, the key driver uh, for this work. But I am very convinced, uh, based on the work that we've been doing, that mobilizing the potential of anchor institution is the only way we're going to build resilience in our communities. The social capital, the political capital, the financial capital that, that anchors bring to uh, this community resilience work is, is, is the, the factor, the factors that will actually change uh, markets. And so this is just a, an example of some of the, the work that we've been doing. And, and I look forward to really discussing this uh, in detail in the question and answers. Uh, the last slide is just uh, to say that we have case studies of all the different um, anchor strategies that we've been using in the diff that looks at the different sectors and community engagement strategies and how to address all of the issues that we discussed in terms of what community resilience looks like and how to make it work. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Denise. Um, and we'll be hearing a lot more about these anchor strategies as we get down to the specifics of how that's playing out on the ground in different communities. I'd like to now introduce uh, Elga Garcia uh, Garza, who's the director of the Agricultura Network and has been an activist and advocate for over 30 years on both sides of the US-Mexico border. Um, Elga, take it away. Thank you, Gary, and Healthcare Without Harm, and all of you tuning in. Um, if we could have the next slide, first slide. Um, I am the executive director of Agricultura Cooperative Network. We're a farming uh, cooperative in the South Valley of Albuquerque. And as many of you know, New Mexico has a long history in sustainable agricultural practices. And um, our organization has been together um, in a farm training program. It started in 2008. And um, our community resilience is in within, within our intergenerational bottom-up approach to sustainable regenerative knowledge in how we grow food and how we grow systems of food development. We have farmers, our mission is to keep our production local, to keep it equitable amongst all of our communities in need. And we have worked throughout all these years very closely with the healthcare system. Uh, specifically, over these 10 years, we have developed an effective farm to market system that through this uh, pandemic has really shown the importance of that local production the importance of our community, years of community engagement, of cross collaborations with the healthcare uh, systems, and also um, just showing that our resilience as a community and the fact that we had local production, years of building trust. Um, we worked many years connecting all the dots to local investment in agriculture, bringing all the core institutions together, working on procurement, 
policy change and adaptation to make that system work where core institutions support the local industry of growing food. So over these years, um, through various programs on collective programs on healthy eating and active living has been uh, taking place for the past five years where we have really built a strong relationship with numerous healthcare clinics here locally and also uh, two major uh, health institutions, New Mexico Hospital, University Hospital and Presbyterian Healthcare. So next slide, next slide please. Um, we partner in various ways and again it is all around healthy eating and active living. We've learned how to work together and I think the importance and the resilience has been the equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion that has been taking place, uh, the trust building, and the fact that we're working on community health together. We're strategizing together, keeping the frontline communities and those that are the most affected at the table and at the core of figuring out these strategies for our community. Uh, we also work with Healthy Neighborhoods Albuquerque, which is all of the core institutions and how we leverage local investment. Um, and uh, we also work on nutrition education with community clinics. That was a big part of our um, healthy eating uh, strategy um, was to actually, because people were so disconnected with cooking fresh produce and cooking meals together as a family, we had to bring that culture and that mindset back. Next slide, please. Um, one way that we've been working with Healthcare Without Harm specifically has been through these community benefit case studies. And Healthcare Without Harm, with their history working with healthcare institutions, has really been the bridge um, the bridge for us to engage with uh, healthcare institutions. And it's really, again, changing the mindset of what is community health? What does that really mean? And how does community benefit when we all work together? A very important factor in our development of building this um, piece of community engagement regarding health, uh, community health, has been the CDC REACH um, program because it's really enabled so many of our nonprofits, community nonprofits, working with frontline communities to all come together and um, strategize with health institutions of how we can make a better uh, place, safe environments, and build on community health together. Next slide, please. Um, in our efforts, we've also been working on a local food solutions with a national vision and um, unified effort amongst these uh, organizations that you see listed here. The local food solutions <clears throat> brings on the dollar store um, campaign that we've had for the past five years, which started here in the South Valley with community members carrying signs in front of the store doing direct action and uh, to make um, dollar store accountable and change their chemical reform policy to take toxic chemical products out of the dollar store. One step further is uh, we're trying and have been working, negotiating with Dollar General executives to get local produce as part of the Dollar General inventory to be able to sell shelf stable products through our value added production line into Dollar General. And again, we reinforce the connection with the healthcare facilities, with healthcare without harm, and helping us leverage our X. Um, uh, funding that could uh, support um, local produce into Dollar General. 
all of our value added production does have health factors, um, salt substitutes, uh, friendly, diabetic friendly jams, uh, uh, low sodium snacks, uh, fresh dried fruit uh, survival snacks. So all of our value added production is again, looking at those health factors. Um, as many, the covert also showed that um, the need for shelf stable products. And many of our, um, Albuquerque is surrounded by 19 native pueblos. Albuquerque being the biggest city in the state of New Mexico is also surrounded by numerous uh, villages, uh, rural villages, and dollar stores are their only form of, of groceries. Next slide, please. Um, well, we continue with the dollar store campaign. Um, to make a long story short, what really moved that campaign forward was our strategy with our national partners. And we continue to make um, success in this project. And uh, last May, we had at the, at the shareholder meeting, um, we had a, a very important um, meeting with the CEO, Mr. Vassar. He sent his executives here to Albuquerque to see our production, see the communities, the four pilot stores we're asking for. And of course, the bigger picture is to take this at a national level. Next slide, please. Here we are right outside of the shareholder meeting. And uh, this was our group that went in and um, defended um, our petition for Dollar General. It has been, um, with its highs and its lows without the, throughout these five years. But I think Dollar General is also um, envisioning this project moving forward and the potential it has um, for their corporation as well. For us, we want healthy food, we want non-toxic products, and that is our ultimate goal within this campaign. Next slide, please. Um, as we work for the future and everything that we've learned through this pandemic has been our resilience to build this local investment in our agricultural practices the community has always been the driver here the farmers worked collectively together to meet larger markets and to keep our production local and to keep our investment in our agricultural practice into the next generation. I wanna give a shout out here to Dr. Bob De Feliz, who is the CEO of First Choice Community Health Sources here in New Mexico. This is specifically talking about uh, First Choice Community Health Clinic Centro Familiar in the South Valley. Please look him up, please help him out. He asked a very important question after 20 years of tending to South Valley community through the clinic. Is our community getting healthier? The factual data and the answers was no. Diabetes was on the rise, various uh, health factors related to diet were on the rise. Um, so a community survey took place and said, what is community health? What would help you get and, and, and accomplish all of us together community health. People said, we want safe places to walk. We want pathways, navigation to sustainable jobs. We want adequate childcare. Uh, we want job training and food was at the core of this survey. So First Choice Community Health Clinic came together purchased 20 acres of land around the clinic, and we are building this wellness ecosystem that will encompass all of those factors of community health. Um, there is um, a YouTube uh, link there. When you have the time, please tune in. Uh, this building is built with also regenerative uh, 
um, with so solar, wind, drip irrigation. We have a well we dug. Um, so we're looking at it as an overall part of community health, encompassing all of those factors that I talked about. And I know that we will get into more of this during the question and answer. So thank you. Thanks, Olga. Uh, fascinating um, and interesting that uh, the anchor strategy started initially with, um, with universities as, as place-based institutions. And then um, the Democracy Collaborative set up the Healthcare Anchor Network and moved to, to healthcare institutions. And now you're taking it in the, another step forward and looking at Dollar General as an institution that is in many, many, many communities and seeing how that can be leveraged to support some of the broader uh, goals you're discussing. Um, we'll come back to it all. Um, the, the final speaker is uh, John Utek, who's been a long-term partner with us at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, has led uh, the sustainability work and energy work um, there for many years. John, tell us how this looks from the point of view of your institution. Take yourself off mute first. Thank you, Gary. Uh, honored to be here with, with the other speakers. Uh, I'm gonna present how Cleveland Clinic has changed its thinking about its role as a healthcare institution uh, in the communities that we serve and share a couple examples that we think are a way that Cleveland Clinic as an anchor institution can transform the health of the communities that, that we serve. Um, Cleveland Clinic's started in Northeast Ohio and Cleveland. We're also in Florida, in Nevada, in Canada, and internationally we're in Abu Dhabi and London. Uh, we employ about 66,000 caregivers. All our workers are caregivers. Um, we see it's now approaching 10 million patient visits a year. Um, and, you know, as a, we're known for surgical excellence. We've been rated number one in heart care for, for 26 years in a row. So as a, as a hospital that's done lots of surgery, uh, we've certainly been focused on the importance of that in the health equation, but what's really been changing at the Cleveland Clinic and in other healthcare organizations is looking at everything that makes a, um, or everything that makes a population healthy. The study that we reference is this one, which says that healthcare itself is 20%, the green pie slice, access and quality of healthcare, but socioeconomic factors, neighborhood and job, it's 40% of health, your own behaviors, diet and exercise, other things, 30%. And then the physical environment is 10%, which is air quality, water quality. So all of these factors, including our health care and the physical environment, people's behaviors, and trying to improve the economic status of our neighborhoods as part of the health equation for the clinic. And we had a new CEO who came in a couple years ago and he created these four pillars, which include our patient and caregivers, our organization, but our community is, is a pillar and we've reorganized our entire organization around this community pillar. So let me share a couple of stories of, of how we're operating and trying to make communities healthier. Um, one is climate change. We're working to reduce our own carbon footprint. We know that man-made greenhouse gases are causing climate change, which have a number of impacts and vulnerabilities you see in the middle. So we're aggressively trying to reduce our energy usage and switch to renewables. Uh, but we're also planning for adaptation, which is our own, which is changing the way that we run and build our own facilities, but also engaging differently in the community and changing the way that we practice medicine. So we, two years ago, set a carbon neutral goal by 2027. And at the moment, we are moving towards that goal. We had energy efficiency has been the foundational part of our work. And at the moment, uh, we set a 20% energy reduction goal uh, about eight years ago, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that we've achieved it through a variety of energy efficiency strategies. Uh, we were, as of the end of last year, we're down 22%. Uh, one really neat solution that we found that sort of touches on these three, these three different buckets um, is we've done a big retrofit, retrofitting fluorescent lights which have uh, mercury in them for LEDs, which use less energy and save us millions of dollars. We picked a local company to make the tubes. Two thirds of the 450,000 cans and tubes were actually made in Ohio by a company called Energy Focus. 
So we created jobs through the manufacturing installation of these products. Um, and we've, you know, had a health impact by using less power because in Ohio, much of our energy still comes from coal, which has deleterious effects to human health. Um, we've done tree plantings. This is a, this is a, a one that we, we created pocket parks in, in the Fairfax neighborhood where our main campus is located in partnership with the Arbor Day Foundation and other not-for-profits. In this picture are 50 high school students that are part of a, uh, a workforce training program that we have to, with, our, with our Cleveland Municipal Schools. Um, other aspects of climate resilience are looking at kind of our own impacts and vulnerabilities. We have hospitals in Florida and there's increasing groundwater flood risk and hurricane risk. That's what these two maps are showing. So we recently built a, a property in, in Coral Springs. We actually, uh, after looking at long-term flood, raise the, raise the elevation of the whole building so that it doesn't uh, as, as the water table rises, we feel we should be able to withstand those changes. And a little bit of foresight uh, is leading, will hopefully lead to better outcomes, you know, in the decades to come. Um, but so that deals with a few stories on the environmental side of that equation. We also have engaged in a, in a big journey in, in our thought as being an anchor institution in the city of Cleveland specifically, and how do we employ our own economic power and human capital to make the city of Cleveland a healthier place. And we've been undertaking something called the University Circle Initiative for under, it's been about almost 15 years now, um, uh, which is an individual named Ron Richards at the Cleveland Foundation, which is a local philanthropic foundation. And he um, connected with Ted Howard at the Democracy Collaborative. And we formed a collaborative table uh, around institutions that surround this area of Cleveland called University Circle, which is the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, and Case Western Reserve University, kind of one of the, the first multi-anchor type collaboratives of this type in the country. And we looked at, at these institutions and said, how can we use our power to make the neighborhoods, the, the, red, the red on this map are our community members and neighborhoods that have economic vulnerabilities. Um, so we created a, this University Circle initiative, targeted these neighborhoods, and decided to consciously use our own power to improve them with four different strategies, live local, buy local, and hire local. How can we as a hospital encourage more of our own employees to live in these neighborhoods? How can we use our own buying power to buy more from companies in these areas? And how can we hire more people from these neighborhoods? That involved us mapping out where our employees lived, which we'd never done before. So this is a map of the red circle is where the anchors live and these dots are where people live. And we've um, put uh, policies in place that encourage people to, um, in certain departments, to hire more people locally. This is Kelly Hancock, who's the head of our nursing institute. We partnered with a local high school that's literally a mile from our main hospital and we're hiring nursing students from a program that existed and trying to increase the flow of nurses uh, from, from this high school. We've mapped our local procurement. So this is, uh, we spend about two and a half billion dollars on supplies. And we discovered that about uh, almost 230 million of that was from vendors in the city of Cleveland. About a half a billion was in Cuyahoga County, which is the county that, that, that we're in. And we are measuring and trying to improve that. Uh, improve that. We've mapped out where the vendors are. Again, this is where our hospital is and these are where these vendors are located. Um, one really neat story that's a part of this is that these four anchors came together and formed something called Evergreen Cooperatives, which is a cooperatively owned business that employs, that's based on residents that live in these neighborhoods. We started a greenhouse and we now buy lettuce from this greenhouse, which is, which is about uh, two miles from our hospital. We've been trying to encourage businesses to relocate into this area. This is a graphic that shows We've, we've actually created more than 700 jobs in the last five years through a business, business and workforce attraction model. We're now tracking how many people we hire from these neighborhoods. It's currently at 6%. We didn't know what it was five years ago. We now know what it is and we're trying to move that, uh, move that number higher. And these are from all the different anchors. Um, and we're doing things like talking to residents. This is, uh, this is from, a, from a summit that we did with practice with uh, Healthcare Without Harm the city of Cleveland and people from university hospitals and Metro Health. And we engaged 50 residents 
and tried to design some healthcare uh, resilience strategies that we could fold into city and county resilience work. Um, recently, we spent $20 million upgrading a laundry facility, basically double the size of Evergreen. And showing the power of local supply chains, this relationship with Evergreen is something we leaned on pretty heavily as we were collecting and, and preparing to sanitize uh, COVID gear. So having strong community partners like Evergreen has been really important um, during the COVID pandemic. We source sanitizer from the Cleveland Whiskey Company. You know, local relationships are responsive and powerful and, and you, can, you can take action much more quickly than these global supply chains where it takes weeks and months to do things. Um, final thing I'll highlight is our place-based strategy where we're trying to improve. This is our main campus. You can see the Fairfax neighborhood. We've created a plan of economic development in that neighborhood. And we're working to attract businesses, which includes IBM's Watson, which we attracted into this neighborhood. We put in health centers, and uh, we're trying to do health education with wonderful partners like Helga and Denise, who are with me on this call. So um, that's, I'm looking forward to our discussion, and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, John. Uh, these are really exciting opportunities uh, that are being displayed. And interestingly, uh, everyone has a project that's related to food, that um, growing food is in many ways growing community. Um, so Elga talked about uh, the work that she's doing with the clinics and this incredible eco center that she's built. You've done it at the Evergreen Cooperative in, in Cleveland. Denise, could you tell us a little more detail about the, uh, the project that's happening in Oakland um, as part of Anchors in Resilient Communities? Because it's, it's also trying to take this food strategy to another level. Great. Yes, thanks for the uh, question. So in the uh, Anchors in Resilient Communities is a multi-stakeholder partnership that includes um, uh, Kaiser Permanente, uh, University of California, San Francisco, found some foundations and community organizations. There's a set of uh, uh, two coalitions that were funded by the California Endowment that were brought together to build healthy communities with nonprofit organizations in Oakland as well as in Richmond and bringing them all to the table to figure out how we actually build um, res resilient communities particularly in these low-income neighborhoods. It, uh, the process really involved a, 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 a strategic planning period in which the uh, study was done, a procurement study was actually done by the um, Democracy Collaborative, again, and similar to John, to figure out where, where dollars were being spent and how to bring those dollars home. Uh, and then out of that, and we, we got, I think it was about $6.4 billion of annual spend, uh, and then, the focus of the work around food, based on a lot of what Healthcare Without Harm has been doing, was um, a commitment made by uh, Kaiser particularly to go 100% sustainable and to buy as much of that locally as possible. And so uh, there's an ongoing aggregation of food demand in that region uh, with the idea of building a local sustainable food ecosystem and to build um, opportunities both on the workforce as well as on the supply supply side. So that means looking at black and brown urban growers and local growers within a 250 mile food shed to actually be suppliers to our, our anchor institutions and to and, and the real work of, of this is being able to build the capacity of these small uh, community organizations, community enterprises to actually produce at the scale and at the quality at which uh, these anchor institutions require. So there's a real investment uh, and organizing that's going on to, to do uh, the work that these community groups are already engaged in, but, but not at that level. Um, and finally, the, the other the part of this that's, that's really interesting is the, the new food processing center, similar to Helga, what you, you're doing, a, a new, I think it's about um, less than 100,000 square foot a sustainable food processing centers being built in the region that will ultimately employ 200 workers um, out of these communities for union jobs, labor union jobs. Uh, there are three unions that's being supported by uh, FSP, which is a food processing company. Um, and so there's a job component and there's a, a sustainable uh, enterprise 
all of this to be cooperatives, right? So that the, um, the food processing center will be an ESOP over time. And uh, a lot of the food growers were talking about forming a food cooperative to, to grow at scale. Uh, a lot goes into that kind of work, including the whole distribution system. Once you grow food, how do you get it to the people that need it? Uh, cold food storage. So that's what, what we're talking about. When we talk about resilience, we're really talking about not individual resilience, but the re a resilient economy. And how do we reorganize our economy to be resilient so that everybody uh, will uh, be greener, healthier, and, and more inclusive? So that's sort of the, the key elements of, of the, um, the ARC initiative in food. And our hope is that, and we, we plan to move into other sectors of the economy and to use, again, the purchasing power to really restructure our energy sector and our, our waste sector and build community opportunity in that process. Great for sharing, thank you. Um, you know, what's interesting for folks who may be on the phone is, is healthcare is 18% of the US economy. Um, and so it has this enormous leverage. Um, uh, and it's the one sector of our economy that has healing as its mission, that has a commitment to do no harm. And so John's speaking about moving away from addiction to fossil fuels, um, leveraging uh, more sustainable forms of agriculture and, and farming to reduce obesity and diabetes and stroke and heart disease. Um, this is a new a new muscle, a new muscle for healthcare to partner with communities. You know, when we talk about community health needs assessments, which, which hospitals need to do every three years, um, often it's in a kind of deficit model. What does the community need um, from where is it suffering? And it feels like the models that all of you are talking about are actually seeing the community as having assets, having wisdom, having knowledge, inter intergenerational knowledge. And so I guess the question to all of you, and you can answer all of you, is what's the, what's the magic kind of relationship? What's the, the healthiest relationship that, that healthcare can have uh, with the communities that it serves to, to build these kind of resilient strategies? Maybe Elga, we'll start with you. Well, in our case, I think it's that long-term commitment that um, we need to invest in as well. Um, we've also, throughout working with uh, the healthcare institutions, we've been able to set a baseline for our outcome. Strong evaluation process. Are we meeting our goals? Are we really advancing in our strategy and in our effort as, as community to be healthier? Um, the long-term commitment also comes with we're changing systems, we're changing mindsets, and we're changing procurement, which is a very important piece in trying to make these connections, not only through positive health factors, but also leveraging that procurement power of these big anchor institutions. So, for us, it's been that process building trust between, um, when I talk about mindset, a lot of times and changing systems, even within healthcare um, procurement practices, we are trying to penetrate decades, years and years of practice of purchasing in an other system that isn't healthy, that you know, isn't sustainable. Um, what this pandemic did, it showed a lot of those flaws, even in our years of trying to build this local food system, it showed certain flaws. And I think right now we're in that opportunity to really dig deep and, and make our system even better. Um, change what, what isn't working at this point within years of practice, we've never, gone through this, but I think um, that is the very important piece in, in staying connected um, and really uh, acknowledging that we are changing systems here. And it is a long-term commitment, but it is also a very crucial piece to community health. Thank you. 
Sean, what would you, how would you answer the question? Yeah, I think it, it, it does, it starts with a changing of, uh, of how we, how healthcare sees the world. And I think as a, you know, our hospital has these beautiful buildings that have risen out of this neighborhood in Cleveland. And to be honest, you know, there's historically been a bit of a divide between us and the community. And really what the anchor strategy did and Great University Circle is try to cross that divide and just have, have dialogues and conversations and just get together and, and talk about um, the shared benefits of, of development. Uh, so I would say it's been this wonderfully illustrative process. And I, I count something like 60 different community relationships that we built in the seven years that I've been here, finding amazing partners like, like Helga and Denise. And I think our senior leadership has changed to see that, that all of these people are part of our mission of health. I'll, I'll share one just story that stuck in my mind. Um, our chief of staff, the person who's responsible for all of our physicians, I interviewed him for our, we, we publish your and Global Compact every year that tells some of the more of these stories. Um, and he, we have outreach to some faith-based organizations and he met this minister on the west side of Cleveland who visited patients that have AIDS and was making sure that they were actually taking their, their medication. And, you know, our chief of staff said, that guy is part of our healthcare team. Really all of these, this network that we're building, we want to build it and make it stronger of, of, of community leaders, um, all the, all, and, and not-for-profit organizations and faith-based organizations and governments are all part of the web of people that can, can build and make these communities stronger. So I think it starts with looking for these relationships, finding success stories and, and building on them. Thanks. Can you... if, I, if I could also answer that and yeah. with my partners just to leverage and riff a little bit is that, you know, these relationships are, are critical because if if there's a crisis that this is a new normal folks and and a disaster will happen whether it's or a tornado or a hurricane a flood a, a pandemic or climate change it's coming and it's coming to you it's coming to the health sector because when there's a crisis people go to hospitals as sort of their safe haven so the the real challenge and opportunity is really to reach out to the community and to build um you know a, a citywide a community-wide infrastructure where people can feel safe in multiple places. And part of that is to recognize that, um, as you said, Gary, there are so many community assets. And, and the whole community development field, as an example, they've been at this work for over 50 years. There's people working on our, our economy and our recreational and our environment. There are folks there and health institutions can't do it by themselves. And so how do you find partners that can help you do that? And the last thing I would say though, I know it's a challenge to because you hear it all the time, who is the community? You know, there's like, there's a sense of paralysis within the health field because they don't know who to talk to. Well, the fact is, is that there's a typology of community groups that do different things. And you need to do your asset map to figure out who does community organizing, right? They could really move policies um, and, and build, you know, constituency. Who, who does and, and create mass campaigns? Who does community service? you know, that could provide basic services to communities and who does community development. And so whatever the goal is, there, there are clusters of groups that work within that goal, but they have different uh, sets of uh, capacities and assets to bring to the, to the story. So understanding what that typology is and to know what kind of community engagement strategies there are is all a part of knowing the science and the art of community engagement. Nice. Uh, there's a question that came from uh, one of the participants. Um, all of you are talking about initiatives that seem very bottom up from uh, the community and from uh, the, the, the local healthcare institution, a clinic or a hospital. Um, how does this sort of initiatives depend or are supported or not by any kind of state government or federal cooperation or incentives? Any of you can answer that one. Well, for us in our food access, uh, we're very tied in to SNAP uh, benefits and the state of New Mexico 
also participates in the Double Up Food Bucks program, <clears throat> which uh, as long as it's New Mexico grown fruits and vegetables qualify under that Double Up Food Bucks program. So that is one way that we stay connected to a lot of the federal uh, policy piece. And right now, as we're working on Dollar General, working on uh, developing our value added production line of, uh, of local food production, um, we have to work on the federal and state level to get uh, the value added production uh, accepted into the double up food bucks. Uh, right now it's not qualified, but it doesn't qualify under New Mexico grown fresh fruits and vegetables because it goes through that uh, process of long-term shelf life. So right now we're, you know, we've been talking with our Congresswoman Deb Hallen, others on uh, uh, New Mexico Food and Agricultural Policy Council, New Mexico Department of Agriculture. Um, so we do have to work on federal and state level uh, and also partnering with those entities in order to uh, look at our bigger strategy, years of long term of what we really want to do with local food production and local sustainability as we build this. So that's an example of one way how we have stayed engaged in federal and state policy work. And I, I just might add one other example, and that's a partnership that we had in the, the Bronx with the Bronx um, um, Community Development Corporation and uh, Monte Fury Hospital, where the state uh, had a Medicaid expansion um, program, grant program that uh, required, you know, the hospitals to access this to, to address issues of asthma. And, but it required that they partner with the community. And so through the community and uh, anchor partnership, they, they did a study uh, with uh, MIT CoLab was a part of this, of, of the emergency room, repeat asthma cases in the emergency rooms to identify where the uh, repeat asthma cases were coming from, the cost, cluster of buildings uh, that then turned into uh, retrofitting those buildings, integrated pest management, as well as energy efficiency work in those uh, clusters of buildings. And what was critical is that a lot of those buildings had, uh, were slum landlords, right? Some were nonprofits and they were really willing to, to clean up their buildings and address these health issues of, of their tenants, but some were slum landlords. And so having an organizing group as a part of that partnership allowed for some tenant organizing and, and withholding rents so that it, it provided pressure point for these slum, land, slum landlords to do the right thing. But it came through a, a state a state funded program, Medicaid expansion program. Great story. John? Yeah, it's, it's, it's fundamental. You know, I talk about local, state, and federal engagement as being fundamental to everything that we do, both in terms of providing resources uh, through, through access to state and, and primarily state and federal grants. I'll just give a couple examples on the, on the environmental side. So the city of Cleveland has a, has a sustainability program. We have aligned our work with theirs because that strengthens their work and ours if we are working towards the same goals and directions. The tree work I mentioned aligns with their, the city's tree plan. At the state level, you know, a variety of different things we've done on state energy policy with Healthcare Without Harm, Gary, with the organization and others, try to influence policy to try to get, uh, you know, rebates. Our, some of the work that I talked about energy efficiency wise relies on utility and state rebates. So that's one example. And then at the federal level, it's, you know, impacting climate policy and trying to engage with conversations about, um, uh, the importance of, of, of thinking about climate and health in a variety of different uh, in a variety of different applications, Gary. So it's at all three of those levels, it's really, really important. Um, and what I've found is, you know, healthcare typically engages with those leaders on healthcare issues. These legislators love hearing us think about these other dimensions, which are a little less about the way that we're reimbursed or, you know, they're, they welcome engagement from, from people around these other issues. And well, you know, it's been a rewarding process. Yeah, let me ask about that. Cause um, uh, healthcare at harm and, and a, 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 a number of health organizations have, have been engaged in, in activating and educating nurses and doctors and health professionals to become advocates for broader climate resilience and yep. sustainability to move away from our addiction in society from fossil fuels 
uh, to stop the pipelines, to stop the coal plants, to create jobs moving toward a green economy. Yep. And so COVID and this crisis over the last four months has even further elevated uh, healthcare workers as incredibly trusted uh, heroes in American society. And it seems like there's an enormous opportunity in each of your situations and around the country to, to countervail against the fossil fuel companies and to take advantage and, in a positive way of, of healthcare leaders as trusted messengers of bringing science-based information to the public about about health impacts. Uh, in, in this case, it's been health impacts related to COVID, but also the health impacts related to climate. Uh, yeah, how would you see the opportunity there? Very much so. Um, obviously, the economic impact of COVID has been dramatic and terrible. But one thing it has done is highlight the, you know, the, the health impacts of our transportation. You know, as, as people have stopped driving, we've seen, we've seen the air clear up and we've seen you know, pictures of, of skylines that are typically, you know, clouded with pollution and they're free. And we're actually, there's a number of scientists that are studying the health impacts of, of, of these changes. And something that we have known, we have this grand experiment and we'll have some data to, to show that actually people's health will be there's a health benefit to this. It's unfortunate, but the less pollution has actually made people healthier for periods of time. I think armed with those kinds of facts, it tremendously strengthens our case to, to, to dramatically accelerate that transition, Gary. Um, and in a collective way that could have positive job and health outcomes really accelerate that transition that you were talking about, 100%. And, and healthcare can be at the lead of that and, and, and leverage this position that we have right now, which is, you know, showing, we're showing our best. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm pleased to be an organization. We, have, you know, you mentioned 1.4 million healthcare workers laid off. Cleveland Clinic has not laid anybody off. I think this is, you know, we've, we've kept everyone and just delayed all kinds of spending and things, you know, because we're, 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 we're it, it, I think it's showing some of the best of healthcare and our, and I'm proud of our, I think it's a great opportunity. Yes. Great. I would follow up quickly just with the other side, the flip side of what the pandemic has also shown us within um, rural healthcare, um, marginalized community healthcare, and especially within our native pueblos. As many of you know, the Navajo Nation has been hit uh, with high, high rates. Uh, numbers keep climbing as the same in Santo Domingo Pueblo, San Felipe, Santa Ana, uh, the list goes on. So transportation, yes, has also been flagged as a crucial piece to this um, um, healthcare uh, with the rural communities. And also, it has also flagged and brought to light um, the social determinants of health that these communities are still embracing and living under. No running water. Um, you know, people are 60 miles from the nearest clinic that has minimal, uh, um, you know, production to help them. So even in coordinating, getting food into the communities has been very, um, uh, has to be planned out strategically with the native communities uh, because of the high stakes of, of precaution that are needed. So all of those pieces have also been flagged within this pandemic. And um, this is again, showing us our flaws, but also bringing to light something that stays hidden for many of our native communities and rural villages. Yeah, thank you for that, Helga. I, I think for me, it just really, highlights the point of uh, local and decentralized um, uh, economies. So you, just unbelievable to see the, the lines for food banks, right? And, and at the same time hear about, you know, food producers destroying food crops because they can't, their distribution system does not align to where people are. Uh, and so how do we, and to your point, Gary, earlier, grow, create local food economies, right? That, that allows for whatever disaster comes, we will have food for our people and there'll be good sustainable food and they'll be affordable. 
and, and similarly, you know, how do we make sure in certain parts of this country, California, you know, they have brownouts and blackouts and in any circumstance where people are on life supports, right? And respirators and ventilators and your lights go out. How do you have a, a distributed energy infrastructure as, as opposed to some large grid? How do we reorganize our communities so that it is resilient against all kinds of disasters that we can expect? Let me ask you a question, a follow-up question, because some of this requires investment, and, and it's particularly investment in communities that have been disenfranchised, uh, in, in communities that have some of the highest rates of chronic disease. Denise, you've been in this community economic development space for a long time. Tell us, how does that, how can we, what can we leverage here in terms of redirecting capital to those those more resilient energy and food and transportation systems? So I, I think they're, like I said, if you're, you're focusing on, on housing and affordable housing, uh, there's no need to reinvent a delivery system to deliver housing for low income communities. They, they have been community developers and affordable housing developers for years. And it's the question of giving them the capacity, the resources for not only projects, but operating support to, to do the work of housing development. The same with the, the producers as we were talking about, local growers, how do we invest in their infrastructure? In, in Oakland, they, they keep telling us, well, we can, you know, we, we don't have the land. We, we are leasing land. We don't have enough land to grow uh, at the capacity that the suppliers need. How do we get them off of lease land and, and get them into land trusts that they can own themselves? They're saying that we need cold distribution uh, centers, you know, where we can all aggregate our food before it gets to wherever it's going to be processed. So it was really looking at who's doing the work in the community, because they're there, even if it's building parks and creating recreational outlets for folks and cleaning up the environments. They're there and to really sit down with these organizations and engage them around um, what's the strategy, and then figuring out the partnership that works best. Elka, where, how, how's, that, how's that Eco uh, Wellness Center being financed? Um, <clears throat> we have uh, capital outlay funding. We also have um, funding and partnerships with Bernalillo County, um, who is helping, and also Presbyterian Health Services. Um, has also funded gr our greenhouses, the, uh, the structure, three of three greenhouses. So we've been working together with city, nonprofit, private, um, and also with a lot of um, funding sources that believe in this eco wellness center as a model for the future of uh, uh, community working together for the advancement of community health. So we're leveraging on all different levels, federal, state, nonprofit, uh, corporate. Um, right now, our actual facility, we've raised half of the, it's a $4 million building. It is going to be solar powered. Um, so right now we've raised 2,500,000 for that building. And uh, we, it was supposed to go up on a uh, county bond in September, but with all of these that we're living right now, I think it's put a little halt in that. Uh, but we continue to work with our legislators and uh, our uh, state senator um, for our district and uh, leveraging their knowledge of building uh, uh, health facilities and also um, the actual health community that is really backing up First Choice to um, help us reach all of that funding that is needed, not only for our Sacred Roots Farm Hub, but the overall wellness facility because it will have a job training center, a health leadership high school, a uh, farm to table restaurant, um, uh, early Childhood Development Center and a recreational center. Wow, what a fantastic wraparound set of uh, services. John, what was it like for the Cleveland Clinic to make such uh, investments in the neighborhood around you in the $20 million for Evergreen and other things? That's, 
that's a new idea for, I mean, uh, Helga just talked about it with the Presbyterian, actually investing uh, dollars in the community. Yeah, I think it's been, um, I, I think it's done a couple things. One is, you know, it, it shows a much deeper commitment to the community investing our own equity, you know, directly in, in the laundry. And we're looking at, at uh, housing and some other projects, you know, to make these direct type of investments, putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak, in terms of directly trying to impact community wealth. Um, and about, what is it, maybe 15 months ago, we met with, you know, uh, our community outreach team organized a meeting with our CEO. And we met residents and just had conversations. And I think what that does is build trust. And that trust leads to more opportunities. Um, you know, I, I think building a stronger trust is, is important to, uh, you know, improve people's participation in our health programs and in the creation of jobs and, and all different kinds of things. And we're, one, there's a fascinating new dimension, Gary, to the Evergreen story. Um, they've created, uh, you know, th that that group was founded. We, we visited the Mondragal region of Spain where there's these cooperatively owned businesses that are a huge part of that economy. And so Evergreen has, you know, we started these couple businesses and we, this, that laundry investment really made that their laundry business, it, it almost doubled it in size, which is terrific. But there are limits to that. So they have now created something called the Fund for Employee Ownership, Gary, and they're actually uh, doing social investing to take businesses that are family owned or private and turn them into uh, either ESOP owned or employee owned businesses. And about two months ago, Evergreen, um, and I'm on the board of the group that, that oversees this, uh, we purchased a, a company called Berry Insulation that does home insulation with residents and created jobs for 50, 50, created 15 employee owners. I really think that, you know, that changing economic model is, is a key to this whole thing. So I think it is our own money and then trying to leverage and multiply the impact of that with, uh, with innovative models like that. Yeah, I, I really like uh, John's point. And the, the, one of the slides that he showed in his presentation uh, we, we really call it import substitution, figuring out where do you spend your money now, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we localize that? How do we bring that away from 3,000 miles and, and build uh, organizations, enterprises, create jobs locally with, with the resources you currently have? And that's the place to start. There was someone on the, on the chat that asked the question, oh my God, this is so large. What, where do you begin? And so if you're a large uh, anchor institution, begin with figuring out where are you spending your money? And, yep. and then how can you better uh, build a table of, of community partners that says, well, can we spend it here? And what, what do you need to help you uh, work at the scale that, that we're looking for? And, and the Mondragon model is, is amazing. I mean, they, they, they pull themselves out of total economic devastation and built a whole economy that was a cooperative economy. And yeah. I think that's the kind of radical thinking that we really need to do to talk about resilient economies. Yeah. Let me ask you a question then. Um, and the last question for each of you. So if you can imagine, I mean, you've described, all of you have described some really um, innovative, transformative change in, in some specific models in Albuquerque, in Oakland, in the Bronx, in Cleveland. Um, if you could imagine this kind of transformative change around this new social contract between healthcare and the rest of society toward these broader societal goals, what would that look like in 10 years from where you sit? What would be different? I'm on the shy. So, <laughs> I, for me, it's really about uh, the social cohesion, the, the social network, the, the relationships, the trust building, Helga talks about a lot, uh, and, and John as well. The disasters will be continuous, and we've got to figure out how we come together uh, in, in trust um, and, and mutuality and um, build a, a different kind of future. And so that to me is it's not transactions, not, not, not how do we do this transaction, but how do we really build 
enduring relationships. And in looking at the staff within the health institutions, probably one half, if not more, of the staff of these are, are from these communities. And so how do you engage you know, the staff um, in a community, community benefit uh, and community health needs strategy that is going to withstand any disruption that may take place? I think the key is the, the social, the community engagement and social cohesion component. Yeah, I, I think I agree with, with what Denise is saying. I mean, I think, I think we're, I think healthcare is seeing itself anew and seeing the way that, um, you know, these, these stories of, of collaboration innovation we're sharing, we need to just, we need to scale them up. I think that's, that's healthcare itself as an anchor continuing to build and envision and create more relationships like those that we've talked about today. And I frankly think it's healthcare expanding its reach and thinking as, as its own impact in terms of circularity. Clearly hospitals are anchors, right? We serve patients in our community, we can't go anywhere. You know, that's the whole anchor concept. But if we're 18% of the US economy, how do we call on the rest of healthcare supply chain, which is global to, I, I see Gary us putting the same type of thinking throughout our entire supply chain. And, and this concept of circularity and local impact and these types of relationships going into our clinical equipment suppliers and our supply manufacturers and, and all the different people that actually supply the hospitals and, and health centers that, that we operate. Okay. Well, for us, I think our partnership with the healthcare community has really built the capacity of our farming enterprise. Uh, without that uh, local support of a sustainable market and that process of really engaging, and it's not only um, the health, the hospital buying produce from our network, but it's also that exchange of how we look at food, saying farmers, native people. We look at food more than just a commodity. We look at it as something spiritual, as something that is healing. And I think in our partnership and as we build this long-term bridge and this long-term relationship with the healthcare uh, institutions, I think that has been at the core that food is medicine, and it has to be change that mindset as to how we procure local investment, talking specifically in my case around food, how we keep our local farmers producing, and how we keep um, integrating that um, concept of food as medicine, not only within our healthcare, but also in all the ripple effects, our school system, our senior nutrition sites, our early childhood development centers, if we're all working at it together through different avenues, but going towards the same goal of community health, for us, that is the 10 year long-term commitment that I think in 10 years, we keep building this um, strategy keep connecting all of the dots on the local, on the community engagement, but also with the institution and the legislative pieces that come in really building a strong foundation and also just bridging that private, uh, corporate and frontline communities, um, all engaging together is really the main piece of building something in 10 years. Um, so for us, I think it's to continue on that path of changing the mindset to healthy eating, active living, local investment, building community assets, and working in health together on all different levels. Thank you. And if I could just add one, one last thing, Gary, and it's really, at the end of the day, can we dismantle the commercial food sector can, and to be local and sustainable? Can we... Can we dismantle the dirty fossil fuel industry and, and make it clean and make it local? Uh, can we have you know clean uh, water infrastructure, you know, and make sure that that our communities are are safe from from uh, key disasters? I think that's the big vision work that we we all share. Yeah. 
So I think um, uh, this has been fantastic and it's clear that the broader healing mission that we're all talking about is about moving beyond individuals to healing communities and also healing the planet and leveraging all of the assets that healthcare and communities uh, can bring together to do all of that work. That's the, the broad vision uh, going forward. I want to thank uh, the three of you, Elga, John, and Denise for um, fantastic presentations um, and for all those who have joined the webinar. Um, there's a lot of resources that are available to people that want to travel down this path. The Emerald Cities has a lot. Uh, Agriculture Tour, Tour Network has some. Cleveland Clinic has a bunch of examples as uh, they've uh, shown. Practice Green Health and Healthcare at Harm have a lot of resources, as does the Democracy Collaborative's uh, Healthcare Anchor Network. Um, we will be sending um, uh, the slides as well as the recording to all the people that that participated as, uh, on this call. And um, we hope that you'll stay in touch with us and help us all on this journey together. Thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, we'll close out.